Good morning, James. Good morning. Hey, great to see you. Uh, look, we are doing our one of our usual uh, ones, and um, I have some uh, questions to throw your way, and maybe we can exchange on this. Um, large scale Scrum. Yes, sir. Um, estimation, uh, refinement, uh, multi team uh, setup, um, multiple teams, more than two teams working on the same product out of the same product backlog for the same product owner. That's that's our life, yours and mine, right? Uh, or at least that's where we try to um, educate uh, teams and individuals. Now, but let's just say an, an average person or an average company um, they did not learn large-scale Scrum organizational structure and design, and they are constantly having this non-ending, ongoing saga. With how do we estimate and refine by multiple teams? How do we make this process robust, reliable, um, and also how can we generate data and metrics from all of this so that we can roll it up to the sky through layers and layers and layers of our organization and still, uh, you know, be you know, be be safe that we are not uh, sending um, ambiguous or or, or uh, uh, you know inaccurate data. What are your thoughts? So, you know, I, I think what's important. You know, ignoring all the metrics is to deliver value to uh, to the user. And my experience is the way you do that is you get the people that are doing the work collaborating as closely with the people that are using the product as possible. And also you create a context in which it's safe to do great craftsmanship. So technical excellence and getting the people doing the work as close to the customer as possible so they understand what's actually going on without a lot of organizational middlemen between the teams and the uh, uh, between the teams and the customers. Now, if you have multiple teams that are true feature teams uh, consuming from a single product backlog, there is sort of a uh, large group facilitation challenge of how do you have conversations directly with the customers. And uh, there are a variety of techniques for running multi-team refinement well that, uh, uh, that help do that. Uh, one of them that I like is this rotation idea where, um, you know, people are broken up into subgroups that don't necessarily align with team boundaries that uh, after several clicks, everyone has, has helped elaborate on every item on the backlog, every, every item on the backlog that's be undergoing refinement. Um, and I think those sorts of techniques um, are very important when what you're optimizing for is the knowledge transfer between the, the engineers doing the work and people from the business or, and people from the user base who actually understand the, the, the business domain that the engineers are trying to serve. And I think it's, it's important to realize that's where that is so good. What's interesting is I have also seen context where the business problem is really well understood. And it's, the knowledge transfer is really within and across the teams. So an example might be uh, nuclear fusion. What do we need for nuclear fusion? Well, the truth is the executive of a power company doesn't necessarily know what he wants for nuclear fusion other than the very simple thing of it needs to be economically viable and produce a lot more power than it consumes uh, and be much more efficient than other types of power generation. And the truth is the engineers understand that in gr far greater detail within all the various expertise and the physicist and whatnot, than does, uh, uh, you know, the business, the customer really says, hey, go make it, give me cool power. And so, and I found that to be true in my case study as well. A lot of the, the, the BIOS work, partially because the boundary was not as, uh, uh, as vertical as I would like it to have been. If you look at our feature team adoption map, it was really an extended component team. Uh, or set a set of extended component teams, um, but within the context of that uh, of that scope, 
these blades needed to come up and connect and implement the same protocol that they've that all the previous generations have implemented. Um, you know, I know Boss has done work in the telecom space, which you know I have not in that regard. But it seems that a lot of their work was we need a new set of uh, cell phone tower equipment that implements the new spec. What is the new spec? Thunk. Here's a big book. Right. It's like so the knowledge transfer is not between the 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 teams and the end customer so much as it is within all the expertise and uh, 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 within the various teams that are cross-functional teams, cross-functional, cross-component. So I think it's, it's interesting to say, to ask, what knowledge transfer are you optimizing for? And the best way to do multi-team refinement is influenced by that, by that answer. And that may change over time. As, as the product matures, it may become a different sort of thing, even if it started as something that the engineers kind of knew. Anyway, so that's it for me, Gene. See, well, you. thanks for sharing your perception um, and, and, and perspective, uh, James. That's very useful. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I can add much to it. We'll just probably add a little bit to what you mentioned. So it's actually a, a, a big point you just made, multi-team <clears throat> product backup refinement which essentially means uh, multiple teams. And uh, we strongly recommend doing this not by team A against team B against team C. It's, it's the uh, mingled um, approach, right? Uh, developers from different teams mingle together, rub shoulders. We we'll call it actually promiscuous refinement <laughs> for the lack of better terms sometimes. <laughs> While doing I this refinement, one. of course, <laughs> yeah, no, no, nothing prevents them from actually estimating on the go. And because people go in a round robin, and bump heads, they, they use what's called the law of two feet, right? Yeah, I'm, I kinda, I'm sick and tired of hearing this conversation. I, I understand what this backlog item is. Let me move on to a different conversation facilitated uh, by other users and stakeholders. So we do round robins multiple times and we understand the same product backlog item being discussed and presented um, uh, by different developers and spoken about by different developers. So we rub shoulders, we understand it's a very, very um, homogeneous mixture of, you know, up to 50 developers in the same room um, working together closely and talking to each other. So in my view also, if we do take this approach, which is, um, I don't say radically different, but significantly different from the way traditional um, multi-team uh, discussions take place, right? You are there, I'm over there, my team is over there. We don't talk to each other. We talk through managers or, or um, translators and, and um, you know, um, people that sit in between. We are going to be naturally facing these typical organizational uh, concerns, um, problems. Oh, um, our teams are not stable and not dedicated. Capacities are not, not, not predictable. Well, in large scale scrum, we don't have this issue by design. Um, our velocities and your velocities are different. Uh, my, our understanding and your understanding is different. It's us versus them. Everyone does, there, there's their own little thing. Of course, uh, their refinement methods and um, understanding that they generate as individual teams is different. Uh, it's like apples and or oranges, right? You can't really mix it up. You can't add it together. Um, so then, unfortunately, what we oftentimes see managers and you know X role people come in and say, well, we're going to do a sophisticated mathematics here. We're going to normalize these estimations. We're going to use a specific scientific formula to come up with some miraculous magic numbers so we can roll them up to our senior executives so they can do budgeting. But deep at heart, everyone knows this is like, this is, this is a fudge mathematics. This is fudged algebra. And, and does uh, the CEO unreliable. care and do the customers care? Do they actually care how many, you know, PBIs are created that sprint. Exactly. You know, they, they, they care about things that are completely different, like return on investment, business impact, business value delivered. So those metrics, just as good as, you know, but whatever your paper can hold. So uh, in large scale Scrum, we actually um, don't deal with this problem, or, or at least we have significantly reduced it because in large scale Scrum, developers uh, from different teams estimate and refi refine and estimate together. Uh, that's, that's, that, this is why we oftentimes hear people asking, well, it sounds like it's just one big team. Well, less product group, essentially, 
uh, at times when people interact and refine and plan could be viewed as a very large um, team that you know people work very closely together without middleman and translation layers and therefore of course refinement and estimation by na you know naturally would be just more reliable I don't want to say more precise because precision and accuracy isn't the same but more reliable and and, and accurate yeah and to be fair um I think both of us are saying that the team should be focused on delivering value, and that's really where stuff that's meaningful, whatever the numbers say. But this, I don't think that, I think people sometimes say, well, then you don't care about dates. It's like, are, you know, is having something ready for a trade show not important? Do you, are you throwing that out, that baby out with the bathwater? Yeah. You want to respond to that one? Yeah, I mean, I can only say that as a paying customer or as an internal user who would be eventually using what's being delivered, I could care less about anything that is tangential uh, or uh, indirect to my uh, personal selfish benefit. And therefore, I would be always looking for business value and business-centric outcomes. You, uh, you have sprinted for two weeks. What have you delivered? You are feeding me metrics. You're giving me uh, promissory notes, IOUs. Well, I actually would appreciate much more if you gave me something tangible and shippable that I can put to use. So um, not to say that all of the indicators are useless and wasteful. Some of them actually, we would need to look at some of them. And also depends who is asking and who is looking at those. But at the end of the day, as a paying customer, I don't want to have a promissory note or a PowerPoint presentation or you know some you know some other sort of a report that talks about it would be nice when we deliver it in three four sprints or with the next release. What's on my plate today? What food can you put on my plate today? I, I'm paying you, right? I mean, I'm a I'm a customer or indirectly through internal budgets. So I think that's an um, important point to make. And with large scale Scrum, just like with Scrum, we tend to deliver, uh, we strive to deliver value with every sprint. And just because we have more people, we um, does not necessarily mean we 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 lose uh, the essence of this. So we actually we're very conscious about this uh, because in large scale Scrum, you know, we are product centric. We have the same product back and the same product owner, and we try to be very careful not to dilute this uh, into some, you know, nonsense we see often. Oftentimes. Thank you, Gene. I think this was great. Um, so thanks for listening today. Uh, remember that Gene and I are putting both of this, uh, we're putting this content on both of our LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn posts. Uh, also, you can find this on your YouTube channel for uh, the Agile yep. Carpentry YouTube channel, which sometimes is an easier way to watch on your phone if you want it to be in landscape. Then uh, sometimes the LinkedIn is kind of hard to see the video. Um, yep. And then also this is available on Spotify uh, in the Agile Carpentry channel.